Hello, my name is Dr. George Mataki and welcome to uh, Introduction to Business uh, Organization. Today we're going to be uh, starting Chapter 3 or 4, depending on what college you're taking me at. You're either taking me in an online class or a face-to-face -face class. Uh, we're going to be discussing global business. Now, uh, this recording may be just a little bit different because I'm using my um, uh, laptop, my mainframe at home crash. So, uh, I'll be picking one up in a few uh, weeks. Uh, you know, it's part of doing business. Okay, so what do we have? You already have access to my concept maps. Remember, if you're not taking me in any of the classes and you just happen to find this YouTube uh, online, be free to uh, enjoy. You get more out of this course in the discussion in the classroom or in the forums when we, if we, it's an online class, the interaction, reading the publisher's uh, 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 books, utilizing the publisher's, um, what do you call it, uh, interactive software, all this and the discussion and the lecture is what internalizes. Otherwise, uh, you just have a general idea. Because remember, this uh, section here is just to give you a quick overview. I'm not going to go into very detail. Uh, you already uh, got the concept maps. Just a real quick reminder so when you're studying uh, um, uh, for an exam or just as a refresher. Oh, yeah, now I remember. Eventually, this is all going to uh, uh, connect and you'll just know it'll be uh, second nature to you. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk a little bit about global economy, major world marketplaces, trade agreements and you know, you know unions. It's a big uh, discussion now with our, uh, uh, for lack of better words, our debate, our election that's coming up, you know, the the. the the, the trade pack, uh, the, the Asian trade pack, whether that was going to go in, you know, both said no. You never know, okay? We'll just leave that. You know, international trade, it, you know, it's important. It's a lifeline for everyone. We're going to talk about the comparative, uh, 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 absolute comparative advantages. You know, as a country, uh, I have some uh, resources that we had from earlier classes, uh, economics. I have natural resources that I have abundance. So I have an absolute comparative, uh, uh, absolute advantage. But then in most countries, we have a comparative end. We do something because of our factors of production, you know, uh, employees, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, you know, uh, standards of living, uh, uh, land, equipment, technology, all those factors of production that we've learned. And there's just more, you know, uh, when we will, uh, uh, read about it in the book, you know, the basic factors of production, economic system, you know, anything that is a resource that makes my country or uh, uh, marketable or have something that somebody else doesn't have, you know, and, and I do it, or I could do it better than somebody else. That's what uh, Roy's driving. No different than a business. I do what I do best and what I don't do as well. I still could do it, but somebody else could do it at a lesser cost, higher quality, and more efficient product. That's what they were doing. So countries are looking the same way. So that's why we had different trade agreements, you know, exchange rates. What's the value of one currency worth to the other ones? And basically, forget the currency. If I have an apple and I want to buy uh, uh, an orange, how many apples to an orange, depending on the scarcity of the product, depending on the abundance of the product, depending on how many competitors and what's the other pricing, all those are something else that you have to look at when one is looking at what does your currency buy? You know, well, how much is your currency worth to my currency? Whether you like it or not, the U.S. currency still goes up and down. It's fairly strong, stable currency. You know, what you'll find out is that we're one of the uh, longest economies around. So we're doing pretty good, you know, and it's stable. We're not the, the best. We're not the perfect. You know, there's an inequality of wealth going back and forth. But you're still doing pretty uh, good when you're looking at what the World Trade Organization um, uh, that we're going to be talking about, where the heck is an organization uh, uh, that considers uh, economic conditions on uh, you, know, you know different uh, uh, countries. Okay, I'll just go on here. You know what are barriers to international international organization structure? That's where we're going to uh, cover that. Understanding different cultures and global uh, uh, barriers to international trade. Um, I got that twice. Okay, let me just stop this for a second, and we'll get get going. 
All right, I have to look at the notes again. I apologize. Uh, the, the basically barriers, this one just tells you all the barriers, the social, cultural, economic, and differences, and legal, and then I go into more of a specific uh, detail. So we're all okay. You know, the different legal and political concerns when you go in globally uh, in different countries, you know, what are their rules and regulations? Uh, are they similar to ours? Are there some uh, uh, unique circumstances or changes one should be aware of? And how the small businesses, you know, the importance of small businesses entering into the uh, international market. I know uh, most of you take me in a community college uh, that I'm teaching, or if you're uh, looking at this thing, look up your community college. You get good instructors, you get a good uh, value for your dollar. A lot of community colleges really don't stress international uh, business as much as they said, because they're trying to work for, you know, there's two aspects. They're trying to work for the, uh, uh, for lack of better words, they're looking at, um, uh, they, they, they got two venues or two markets. They do, they help the small businesses, uh, you know, train their employees and everything else uh, very specific for that, uh, uh, for their location. So they figure, hey, well, let's get the local economy going. And then you're also looking at transferability to other four universities. Uh, and a lot of four-year universities, if you're looking at, they may not have a, a strong international uh, business program. So they're not gearing them to that. They're trying to get them set up so they have uh, a, a good general uh, ed classes going forward. So in, in lack of words, they're not really stressing international business uh, courses as well as they should. Though. My background is in my, uh, when I was going for my doctoral, my dissertation, uh, d dissertation was basically uh, how important is international business uh, to uh, 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 to a community college. Everyone said administrators all the way up. That's who I was interviewing. Yes, you know, in, in Illinois it's very important. But then when you look at uh, a realistic and uh, at the course curriculum, very little international uh, courses are offered. There's a few colleges, one or two. If I'm mistaken, I can't. I don't want to state one over the other the, in Illinois that has a little more international courses than uh, the other the majority they lack me. You need this. As a global economy, you have to start thinking because of the internet, technology, everything you're going to look at there. Uh, Visa, MasterCard, you can do that all international. The exchange rate's all done for you. Why not open up the market for small businesses to sell internationally? And that will affect our balance of trade. So there's a big push for small businesses to the Small Business Association to go more international. You know, start off your business, open up a market, you just do a website, come on, you can create the website. That's where you have to look. Look at international uh, thing. Something, sell a t-shirt, sell something. That's a market that is another stream of income from business. So don't look Close off the international. Yes, you want to start globally. I want you to start thinking globally. I can make money here, but also think, uh, I mean, locally and globally at the same time. Look outside. Okay, so let's get going on this. Otherwise, I'll be longer than my hour I always try. Okay, global economy. Globalization, if you look at, and remember, we already discussed this, the process by which the world, and let me make this just a touch bigger for those of you like myself. Let's see what 200. Yeah, a little bit too big. Hang on a second. Hang on. We're live. Remember when you're taking me, just like you're in the classroom. Okay, 150. So it's the process by which the world economy is becoming a single interdependent uh, system. Total value international trade is about, you know, 20 trillion. That's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Uh, so if I'm looking at it, we are, if you look at the uh, Freeman. We're a flat economy. What affects in China affects us. You know, affect uh, you know whether we're buying, we're going to recession. It affects the world economy. Right now, there's a glut of oil because you know Iran is now has a uh, 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 status for the embargo that we're going to be talking about it has been lifted on, uh, on on that country. So now they have oil. They're trying to get back into it. So there's more oil. There was I was reading some place on the news. They were saying that the oil price would be down to dollar sixty five by December. That's what they're predicting. Hey, remember enjoy it now but eventually it's going to go back up once you have that uh, a surplus is uh, and the, some competitions uh, uh, will leave and some will come back as we've talked about in economics okay you already know the difference between import and export I just opened up you know produce uh, 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 products made or grown at, uh, abroad but sold domestically now export again 
products to me, uh, made domestically and shipped overseas. We get a lot of imports. We got to start exporting to improve our balance of trade. Now, government and businesses are worried the benefits of globalization. The government is giving grants and it is uh, uh, availability of cash and assistance to the small business association at the, every community college. They're connected with them. Go in there and see what you could do by having more small businesses start exporting will help our uh, uh, deficits and our uh, an unfavorable balance of trade. That means we have more imports than exports going out. You want to have more exports and less imports coming out. Okay, new technology made travel, communication, and commerce faster and cheaper. <coughs> like or not, that's the world we live in. Yeah, it's got its pluses and it's got its negative. From a business perspective, let's look at the pluses and let's get, get the different markets out there. Word population by uh, by content. I'm just going to show you this one here, just a little bit bigger here. Let me just make this here real. Uh, there we go. When I'm looking at the world population, okay, when we're looking at the world population, all I want to this uh, picture shows is. You know, a lot of times, the United States, you know, sometimes we get a bad rap, or, you know, a lot of times we get a bad rap. But uh, what happens is that, look, in the United States, world population, the North America, right, and this Canada and all this, the North American, let's just figure for us, for lack of a better word, 7% uh, uh, of the whole world population. I think someplace, some sense of us saying we're using like 40 or 50% of uh, all the uh, natural re uh, resources outside of the world. We're using a lot. You know, so... We gotta be a little more conservative, more uh, 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 watching and not, you know, you know, look at natural resources and conserve. Use it not to diminish our quality of life or standard of living, but use it effectively, efficiently, not only in business but also as an individual consumer. That's my two words. But now, when I'm looking at this map globally. Forget that's the uh, one side, the ethics and the social responsibility side. Now let's flip over. Why are businesses in the U.S.? You know, everyone, there's only so many people I can sell to that ha already has so many products and everything else. You, you know what I mean? So where could I sell to? Look at Asia. You've got Asia. You've got India. You've got China. You've got 60% Japan, uh, in, in this area here. Uh, the population, their quality is going up. Their standard of living is going up. Their population is moving from a developing country to a, uh, a, a world power. They are a world power. So look, where can I sell my products? There's a whole new market. you got Australia, 5%. Okay, yeah, close enough. Africa is another one, 14%. Not that much of a population, but a lot of uh, uh, natural resources. But there, you, you know, I mean, Europe, 10%. So you see a lot of companies are going uh, going into that direction because that's where the markets are. That's where the customer bases are, and they have to learn about them. Okay, so that's the real quick general. Okay, now, major world uh, marketplaces, you know, as managers, we are involved in international business. This is supposed to be markets. Excuse me, market. There we go. Uh, have a solid understanding of global economy. Take a few classes, even at community college. Uh, 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 I teach... Uh, uh, International finance, international business. You know, look me up at uh, uh, you know the community college. I'm in uh, Lake County or uh, uh, Northern Cook County. The two schools. Okay, a distinction based on wealth. If I really look at it from a business perspective. I look at wealth. The World Trade Organization looks at different wealth. So if you look at countries, not really necessarily in population and everything else, it looks at high-income companies, annual per capita income greater than uh, 11000 uh, annually. That's, to us, we go, man, that's not a lot of money. But so you already know it's a high-income country. Upper middle income uh, income of 11000 to 3050 uh, you know, 3500 You have to understand now, when you look at parity of uh, 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 parity agreements or exchange rate, what the economy, what I buy for a smaller currency, maybe a smaller, but I could, uh, I could buy more for that uh, uh, that amount. I'm not going to get into it. I just want you to think a little differently. Because look, I, when I go uh, traveling, if I go to Boston, the call, cost of living is higher. So for the, the amount of money I have there, it costs me more to get something. Equivalent to if I go to like Kentucky or Tennessee, where the cost of living is lower. So basically the same dollars, I can buy more for that.
Okay, that's kind of the same thing with the exchange rate. Often, often called developing countries. Okay, geographic clusters. And if I'm looking at the, you know a, a marketplace like North America, you got U.S. is the largest stable economy. You have Canada and there are partners. Uh, all right, uh, you've got uh, Western Europe. You got Germany. I'm just looking at the big ones that the book is talking about. Uh, Pacific uh, uh, Asia. You got Japan, China, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and the South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Philippines. You didn't put North Korea on there. There's so many embargoes on that country. Like it or not, you know what I mean? Uh, not, uh, okay, now trade agreements and unions. This is a big one we had to be looked at. You have NAFTA. When I look at NAFTA here, North American Free Trade Agreement, Mexico, Common Markets, Protect. We talked about this, you know, labor against fear of uh, jobs. I think there's a balance on there. Everyone didn't get what they wanted from the NAFTA agreement. <coughs> I know, President election, they said they want to change something. But, you know, you got to agree, but let's. But the way to the agreement goes up for changing, but there's always room for adjustments. Uh, okay, then you have European Union, and you've got MAP similar to European Union. You've got uh, 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 similar to the United States, stronger economy. I'm not going to give it well, I did tell you, I'm going to look at everything else. Individual countries, uh, you know, 12 billion new jobs. So now they could move from one country to another. Let me just pause this just for one real quick second. Uh, okay, let me just go here. Hang on. Okay, we add. Okay, am I working? I'm recording. Oh, sorry, I don't know if my pause is working. Okay, I was trying to make it work, but it didn't work uh, out right. So, okay, let's go NAFTA. Uh, so, after NAFTA, we have the European Union. Uh, remember, um, my uh, laptop wasn't working as well as my uh, mainframe. Once I get the mainframe going, I'll be able to do more of the recording, going through a PowerPoint or through some kind of a, a, a picture or movie during this presentation. Okay, so European Union, basically, similar to the United States, uh, common markets. When you talk about a common market, you have the euro, it's a global currency, new opportunities, single market, no barrier. Uh, you know, they had to give up their sovereignty, just like in the United States. Uh, you know, we have to give it up. But I want to show you, I thought I had, um, uh, you got the website, later look up on the website. We did this in the classroom, so we'll be all right. And the map of the EU, if I look at the map of the EU, I show that. What it basically is, you could basically drive to all these countries. You know what I'm saying? So there's no longer the individual countries' borders. This is like me driving from uh, Illinois to Wisconsin or Iowa or anywhere I want in the United States. I have freedom to go from one country to the other. So it's basically similar to the United States on that. All right. So we take care of the European Union, but that you know. So you have that, and then that was basically was created to offset the growth of the European Union for the United States, because the European Union with the you know, when the, uh, the East uh, fell, uh, the Western uh, uh, Western Euro Europe basically when they. Uh, Came to uh, came together again. Uh, they had uh, 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 inexpensive labor from the east. Okay, technology wasn't there because of communism, whatever. But they had inexpensive labor, so uh, uh, NAFTA was supposed to get that inexpensive labor from, uh, lack of a better word, from Mexico. The relationship with Mexico, but it ended up uh, didn't realize what was going to happen with China. China became a, a power. That was uh, now you may see the uh, uh, European Union, the United States working together, uh, economically uh, working forward. But uh, to, putting that in, uh, into perspective, you have the general agreement on tariff, and if I'm looking at sign 1949, and it's to reduce or eliminate trade barriers or restriction between countries legally, some kind of a, a world organization. You know, so it's an agreement, uh, uh, encouraging nation to protect domestic industries within agreed. On limits of what they'll be trading and moving, not to hurt one over and another. The World Trade Association began in January uh, uh, 1st, 1995, and Gantt is the actual treaty that governs the World Trade Organization. So, this treaty here is signed basically, here's the, <coughs> the mechanism or the, the control arm or the enforcer of the treaty, for lack of a better word. Headquartered in Geneva, independent entity of 159 members. Global mediation, cross-border trade issues, whose uh, purpose is overseas, global business. Again, you could click on here. I'm not going to do that now, but uh, let's click it on for a second. Remember, uh, we did it in the classroom. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, so I'm not going there. Okay, so uh, uh, it's not working. Uh, you've got it. Stop it. Click on there. You also have the Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nation, found in 67. So the United States, when you're really looking at, they are trying to economically connect to other countries that not only benefits us, but benefits them. 
And the rationale, I think, what it is with the U.S. government or other governments, including China, Russia, or Japan, when they make connections with uh, economic connections with other countries, that once you rely on that country for some economic support, and that could be either for uh, them supplying us cars, supplying certain types of food, or labor or manufacture, you would have less chance of any kind of a uh, major disagreement or war between nations, because each one sees the benefit of helping each other out, in theory. Hey. I've taken history classes and everything else, okay? All right, so now if I'm looking at the association, here's a map of the countries that you look at, they're all similar. And it kind of makes sense. Since you become like a block, it's almost like an economic. It's a little different than if you're, we studied economics, macro and macroeconomics a, a, a couple of chapters ago, where you're looking at when you open up a business, a chamber of commerce, they try to encourage people to come into this economic area to, uh, uh, buy goods and everything else, and everyone in that block uh, benefits, okay? And the next one is you have CAFTA, basic essential uh, American free trade, the free zone, Costa Rica, Dom uh, uh, Dominica, Republican, and you know, the rest of it. I'm just going real quickly. I'm not trying to go on all of them. We got Brazil, Argentina. So we have certain blocks of people for certain things. And remember, when you have an agreement, you have to find a mutual. Right now, we've got all these agreements, and where the big issue is, we're not getting anything back. They're sending everything here, but they're not buying our equipment. They're not buying our goods, our services. So now we have this big deficit. We in the United States, we owe everybody, okay? And now this one's the one that's really going up. Trans-Pacific Partnership, you have to consider an agreement with nine nations free tri uh, a free trade buy. That's going up, and it doesn't look like it's going to go. That was supposed to be happening because of the election, politics. It may go down the road, but right now that uh, doesn't look like it's going to happen, okay? So now you have international trade. I've had lots to go. Let me go in here. The balance of trade, that's what we talked about before, total economic value of all products that it exports minus the economic value of all products that it imports. A balance of trade. You have a balance. Imports, exports. Trade surplus, positive or negative. Country exports. Sells to other countries more than it imports. This is what we should be at. We should have a positive. We should be basically exporting more than we're importing. Trade deficit, where we're at. When a country imports more than export, we have so much import, but no one's buying our stuff. We have to be, and some of that's our own fault. We are a service nation. We, you know, we got. We're going back to manufacturing. If you read the things, we're increasing. We, we need technology. We got more manufacturing and technology. A lot of community colleges are also teaching people not only to get a community college, a social degree in engineering uh, and uh, or uh, programming or some kind of manufacturing technology, because the new manufacturer is not just the old and pouring stuff in. It's all with computers. It's able to read data, able to understand data, able to make uh, uh, program adjustments using computer and technology <coughs> so there's a big need of workers but there's a shortage of those workers who had that skill set so that's why the stem you know the science technologies um engineering and math is basically uh very important okay so our training partners uh just you know uh, uh, uh you can see our imports exports on here i'm not going to go real quickly we talked about this our powerpoint uh, trade deficits you know countries in which uh uh, it exceeds we're up in there so i'm not gonna look at it i just flipped it on so you can stop and make it up those of you looking at me at uh, at um, using this in facebook i'm trying to make it. i got 20 minutes and i gotta finish the rest of this chapter i'm going to speed up a little we discussed this in class you read about this this is just to bring it all together exchange rate what's the definition of exchange rate exchange rate the value of one country's currency to another nation's currency. High value to dollar. When the dollar is traded for more than the uh, foreign currency, foreign goods are less expensive to us. So that's what we're buying. Yeah, our dollar is strong. Is that good yet? Yeah. For consumers, good. For business, it's terrible. Because those buy our product. If we have a weak dollar, people like our quality of product, they buy our products, but it's, uh, it's costing them too much. So weak dollar hurts us as a consumer because it costs us more to buy uh, uh, imports, which would probably uh, help us to slow down. But if we have a weak dollar, more people buy our products. We can export more. 
so low value. The dollars trading for less than forwards courtesy. Foreign goods are more expensive. Now we are competitive. And this helps our jobs and everything else are made factory because people still trust American brand. They like our quality. They know our, you know, we still got some uh, things that go wrong, but the majority of the time our products are really good and they like that, uh, that symbolism. Yes, I get American uh, product. Okay, example exchange rate. The U.S. dollar, the British pound, was $2 to the <coughs> to the uh, uh, one pound, which means that it costs uh, uh, one pound to buy uh, $2 or one dollar to buy uh, 50 cents. Stated differently, one pound and two dollars had the same purchasing power. Depending on the country. You know what I mean? So what, how many dollars I need to buy something depends where am I at and what's the purchasing power, the parity of purchasing power. Take me for finance or take a finance class at your local community college and you'll explain it in very layman's terms okay okay competitive advantage we talked about this already absolute competitive advantage the ability to produce something more effectively efficiently than any country can something cheaper and a higher quality right saudi arabia you got the oil brazilian coffee canadian timber they got a lot of uh, they they have an abundant supply so they're absolute advantage you know i could try it grow it, but they got so much i can't beat them they just have the natural resources doesn't mean we don't have it here it's just it makes more sense to utilize theirs because it's cheaper uh, at the same quality than what i would have to do to pull it out of uh, uh our own uh, facilities. Okay, compared to the advantages, ability to produce some products more effectively. So do what you do best and sell that, and buy and what you don't do as well, you buy from somebody else. Now you have the national competitive, uh, let me go with this, I'll just close this down. I'll just open it, ah, I'll leave them open, okay. I'll go through this because so, so you can just stop it and write it down. National competitive advantage, factors of uh, condition of factors of production. Physical resources, information, labor, capital, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. And remember, the biggest thing for all of this factor of production to be effective is that the people, the quality of uh, standard of living is, uh, is adequate and a, a quality of life is there. So I can make the money and I have some way to spend the money, but I can keep some of the profits, which I made. That's like that, you got to have some capitalistic uh, 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 aspect into it. And you see the Chinese and the communist countries, socialist countries, uh, they're, they're basically moving towards that direction. Okay, uh, demand conditions. A large domestic customer, a consumer base that promotes strong demand for innovative product. <coughs> we basically want something different. We like, we like to change what's innovative, what makes our life easier so we have more free time or Supposedly, that was the theory. Okay, three, related uh, and supporting industries, strong local and regional suppliers and industrial customers, strategies, structures, and revenues. Uh, refer to firms and industries that stress cost reduction, product quality, higher productivity, innovative products. Okay, going international. How do you go international? There's an international demand for my product. You got to ask these questions before you even start. Can the product be modified to fit a market? I don't want to change much. I want to just send it there. Maybe I got to just send it, uh, change my marketing campaign. Put it instead of a Polish person, put a Hispanic person, put a Middle Eastern individual on there. Whatever is still culturally acceptable as we're going to go on. Is there. Is a foreign business climate suited to import? Does the firm have or can it get skills and knowledge to do business there? You know, a lot of times we're talking about you get an agent, you know, here's a decision chart and we already have it. Can you produce it? Yes, no, stay domestic. Yes, you can import it. Do I need the uh, skills? Go international. You should even try. Remember, I'm always pushing because a lot of times you can sell little things unique. A lot of people overseas, they want something that's American, something simple. And a lot of countries, if you're a small business, they don't mind you coming in there because you're not they're not thinking you're actually going to take over the whole market and they work with smaller uh, uh, companies anyway so you, there's always a fit okay levels of involvement <coughs> the, the, the book basically is a little bit more but we'll just go this one international firms most international firms conduct a good deal of their business abroad may even uh, maintain overseas manufacturing you know later on we're going to talk about the uh, 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 facilities overseas Okay, be large, but basically still domestic companies. So I've got a lot of exporting, a lot of things out there. You know, Hershey's, for instance, buys ingredients and chocolate from several foreign suppliers, but makes all the products in the United States. Remember, you could import stuff or import a lot. Try to start thinking from a local business, from your business. How can I export? How can I open up a new market out there? I mean, you know, it, it, so once I understand it, man, I could, and they love my product, that opens up. So if it's 
the economy kind of slows down here that we've learned, but it's booming over there. I'm still surviving and keeping people here in the United States uh, employed. Okay, multinational firms designs products, uh, produces products uh, in many nations. You know, Exxon Mobil, Nestle's, IBM, Ford. It just makes sense. You know, and you have a lot of foreign companies here. <coughs> well, later on, we're going to talk about protective tariffs and different rules and regulations and cultures. Uh, it just makes sense to uh, uh, build the plant here. Do you keep the money here? Or, and the whole thing is when you pull the money back, the profits of the United States is either to get taxed back at your home country or when do you leave it here and reinvest back here and expand your market uh, uh, globally. You're a multinational organization, and I should be forward, definitely uh, uh, most of the majority of them do not have any uh, loyalty to one or another country. They may be based someplace because of the tax advantages, but they look at the whole world as their uh, economic market, as a whole market. There's different places, you know, how do I sell them? And they have different, uh, maybe similar product, but different campaigns, different uh, way they uh, logistically, different way they package it, produce it, and uh, price it. Okay, international organizational structures. Let's look at this one. Independent agent, those are the most easiest one. Foreign individuals or organization that agree to represent and export interest. Sometimes it's a, 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 a certain areas may be very hostile or anything else, and you don't understand the culture. You don't understand, uh, you don't have the connection, for lack of a better word. Uh, so you may uh, hire an independent agent, but make sure that he or she is still going underneath your moral and ethical uh, values that you say, hey, I don't want to have any child laborers. I want to treat the employees properly. I don't want them working 90 hours. I want them to have 40 hours. And those are the rules. Or you can say, hey, I don't care what you do. You know, and that's an unethical business person. A, a good, social responsible business person will make sure the independent agent, this is it, and make sure you have some checks and balances on it. That's just my little few words on that. Okay, licensing agreement. Uh, firms give individuals Individuals or companies in a foreign uh, country right to manufacture or market a foreign product. In return, the licensor typically receive free loyalty. Remember, once you give them a license agreement, you basically give them information. So if they break up certain countries, China, for lack of better words, has a lot of things where people will make copycat because they got agreements. You know, and the Chinese government is cracking down on that, especially if they're going globally. It doesn't make sense because <coughs> manufacturers won't open up to you if they figure you don't have any laws protecting my rights. You know, I came up here using this in, in good faith and now everyone else is making it and you're not stopping it. And the Chinese government is basically uh, uh, trying to re, uh, minimize that. It's not, you know, it's still hard, okay? Okay, strategic alliance. A lot of strategic alliance, a long-term partnership between two or more com uh, companies established to help each other company build a competitive market advantage. Not necessarily still could be competitors, but you have some kind of alliances that say it's beneficial to, uh, to both of us, okay? Uh, protocol is cost risk, don't typically share the cost or risk or profits, provide broad access to markets, capital, and technical uh, uh, expertise. The foreign domestic investments, here's where you're basically building plants and equipment on uh, in another property for cost savings, for some incentives, or you know, uh, or just creating jobs or goodwill. But you're still making profits, and you're keeping it in that country. The countries like China. A lot of people are investing in China because now they understand the market. People know the brand name, and now it's be easier for them to transport without worrying about tariffs or anything else. Just regular taxation that's within that country. A Dow Computer has uh, built the semi plants in Europe and China. Volkswagen has built the uh, factories in Brazil, not only for Brazil but goes international. Foreign subsidiaries, a company owned in a foreign country by another company called the parent country. In uh, finance, we take international finance, we go a little bit more into uh, detail on this, just so you understand. Don't get too hung up. Remember, the series you're taking here, that you're taking me at the community college is uh, uh, understanding uh, business uh, or uh, you know, uh, business uh, overall, from small to large. A basic understanding of what all business functionality happens. So you're getting bombarded with a lot of information. Every one of these lesson plans is a full course. I'm just giving you a quick overview at a high level, okay? So you understand how all the parts fit. And then as a small business entrepreneur manager, you have to understand all of them because this is how businesses operate, okay? All right, so we've got, now remember, we're only talking about the international here. Okay, now the main barriers for international, remember they got another barriers for international, this is just a continuation, I should have went like this one, just go here, okay? Uh, it's just a continuation. You have social and cultural differences, and we'll talk about this, economic differences, legal and political. So if I'm looking at social, it must be aware 
of differences among nations, social uh, structures, you know, how it's set up, different religion, different languages, what's acceptable, what's not, what's their values, what's their beliefs, what's their rule, you know, how do I tire if I'm a woman, uh, a businesswoman working there, what's the, you know, if I'm doing business transaction with a company, fine, you can dress Western, but I go outside into the host country's uh, 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 environment outside, I have to dress appropriately to that country because I may be violating some rules or uh, uh, because of that culture, okay? Uh, economic differences, and we'll look at economic, the common currency, legal and political differences, and we'll talk about their global system of laws. We talked about the ID1 in 159 countries, with the World Trade Organization, or, uh, okay? Uh, laws must be consistent, foreign, uh, corrupt practices. If I look at this, U.S. business laws, <coughs> businesses, excuse me, must follow U.S. laws while conducting business overseas. It's not like I'm in Russia and they just say, I got to pay off somebody. I'm not saying, I'm just not a, just generalizing. And I got to pay something to get something done, pay a bribe, and it may be acceptable, even though contrary to everything else, they say, no, let's say it's acceptable. I could still be punished not only there by the, uh, violating their laws and rules, I could also be uh, punished here in the United States because we're supposed to be still uh, operating by the same standards. Uh, uh, business standards and uh, ethics and values of the United States business uh, person, even though if we're working overseas. And that's what this uh, 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 Foreign Corrupt uh, uh, Policy Act uh, basically says, okay? All right, so let's close this up. Now, let's see what we have. Understanding cultural uh, businesses. So the whole stage basically is, I think it's from IBM. He had the, IBM was all uh, the, the worldwide, and he looked at different cultures and everything else and tried to find a similarity. So when businesses go into certain countries and they understand what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, it basically broke down to these, uh, these five, social orientation, power orientation, uncertainty orientation, goal orientation, and time orientation. You've got the chart here, I, I put it up there. It basically says social orientations, collectivism, individualism, you know, and then I think more, uh, here's where we are, United States, this is more China, uh, Japan, power, respect, authority is increases, power, tolerance, individual cross authorities views all of its uh, 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 protocol, rights, and everything else. So now I'm really looking at this, a nice chart, and it gives you a general idea of, uh, how the culture is so you can understand it what's acceptable what's not acceptable how you approach it and if i look at this and i just flip them on so you know and it basically talked about the same thing you had in the chart various group which they belong two extremes individualism which is mostly united states you got, uh, uh, austria canada new zealand uh, Mexico and everything else. You know, I was surprised in Mexico. I thought Mexico would be more of a, a collective type, but according to this, this is where at Greece and Hong Kong, you're more individualized. Eh, you picked up an American uh, 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 attribute, good or bad. You know I mean? Okay, collectivism. Oh, here it is. I got Mexico in the wrong I didn't think they would belong in there. I apologize. You are still very basically believe that group comes first. Uh, Greece, Hong Kong, <coughs> excuse me, Taiwan, Portugal, uh, Singapore, Colombia. I just put in the wrong thing. Remember, I create these slides for you, okay? The next one, you have power orientation, and again, beliefs that people in the culture hold about the appropriateness of power and authority. The differences in hierarchies, such as business and organization, power and respect. People tend to accept the power and authority of their superiors. Most still, give or take. You know, you still have some unrest, uh, all cultures, you know, Depends if you're being abused or not. Uh, simplif uh, simplifying the base of their position in the hierarchy. And to respect the right that hold the power. Singapore, Hong Kong. Okay, they respect that. Uh, uh, uncertainty orientation. <coughs> Feelings individuals have regarding uncertain, ambiguous situation. Uncertainty acceptance. United States are stimulated by change. We like the uncertainty. What's going to happen? What's new? Oh, man. Even though we hate the change, but we enjoy it. That's what we thrive on. That's what we're... If we really look at what makes the United States strong, other than we're a collective individual, is our creativity. We come up, we think out of the box. No one's done this way. How can we go around that? How can we fix it? What can we do different to make it better for not only our society, but for the world? We're creative. You, know, you have uh, uh, China and other countries coming in there and saying to see how Americans come up with this creativity. And what they find out, we got, because we got so many different cultures, you just bombard it with different ways of looking at things and then you finally try to solidify different ideas into one uh, uh, conceptual uh, uh, plan or idea or innovative uh, uh, 
process or concept. Okay, goal orientation. You know, uncertainty. Dislike and avoid ambiguity whenever possible. Didn't list any country. I don't think you don't want to get in trouble. Okay, the manner in which people are motivated to work towards different kinds of goals. Okay, very goal oriented. You know, some people are more goal oriented than others. Aggressive goal, uh, goal, uh, uh, goal behavior, extreme and place high premium on material possession, money, assertiveness. I think this would be more the U.S. Passive goal behavior, higher value in social relationship, quality of life concerns. You can see a lot of uh, like the French. Uh, or a lot of socialist countries, they more like to enjoy life. We are so piped up, including myself, want, 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 get this, go ahead. You forget how to relax before you know it's over with. I'm now slowing down a little bit. I'm beginning to take your time. And I really do stress, try to find that balance. I know it's a lot of work in you know, taking my courses, going to work, uh, 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 raising a family, or, you know, helping someone else within the family, or, or, or a lot of things, you know, a lot of people have two or three jobs to go to school and, and to make the family uh, successful. So you can do it, but still try to find that balance. For the time you have, you do it at your work. I enjoy this, is good. You get to break in the car, look at the sun, look at the sky. I'm trying to find, you, you have to find that way to relieve your stress. Walk a little bit, you know, don't rush, take your time. You're stuck in traffic, have a coffee. You turn on the TV, uh, turn on the radio, no texting. All right? Okay, then you have our legal... Co okay, let's see the next... So we take care of the articles. That'll, okay, now we have our legal concerns. Your know, general information about legal concerns. Uh, uh, there is no global system for laws. We do have t uh, agreements and everything else, but not a global system for every country. This is not the world order is yet there, but you never know. It seems like we're going that direction. Laws may be inconsistent, corruption, bribery, and foreign market. Remember, and the only thing I want to talk about dumping is unfair practices. Is selling a product in a foreign countries lower than producing uh, than at the producing country? So, it's when you you have dumping in country. Uh, a lot of con uh, countries are part of the whole manufacturing business and, and part of the global. You know, the communist and social countries they're uh, they're involved with the business. Uh, climate a lot more than the U.S. You know, we, we get the laws and everything else, but a lot of, the, uh, a lot of other countries, they are uh, partners with in their, uh, their, their business, so they get some kind of profit or something out there. Different situation. All right, so, but what happens is now, they want to go into an international country, another country, and they're going to say, we're going to sell our product. And China's been already accused of this, and, you know, so it's, it's, I'm not doing anything else that's going to offend anybody. Just look it up in Google <coughs> or do your own research. So they get, buy the product. They get all our uh, uh, recyclable stuff. Uh, we send it to China. They melt it. They send us the steel bag. But it, they, they charge us a lower price than what it costs them to produce it. And, and the fact is they got all this material to keep their employee, you know, keep their constituents working, whatever the cost is. You know, I'm not saying they're, they're trying to get rid of the steel industry in the United States. They, you know, they have to look for their own economy. Uh, I'm open-minded on that. All right, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that's, a, that's the way it goes. But anyway, they bring it in here still cheaper because they're making, you know, just like the U.S., you know, uh, when the farmers, the cornfields, you know, there's so much production all over the world. What does the U.S. does? They basically subsidize uh, 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 the farmers by paying them for the seed. So indirectly, they're doing a uh, tariff. They're basically paying them uh, uh, for their crop at a higher value than what it's worth. But anyway, but they're taking this crop and they're, selling, they're dumping it here. And, and that's illegal. And the reason it's illegal is because after a while, what happens is our industry, the steel industry, can't survive the prices there. And so what happens is we go out of business, our industry goes out of business, and now we only have one supplier, and that's the Chinese steel supplier, and they could raise the prices, and we're dependent on the resources and everything we make. But going forward, it looks like everything we're going to be made is out of plastic, heavy plastic, lighter, uh, 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 easier and everything else to uh, to work, but you still need steel for buildings, for construction, for manufacturing. So you want to make sure you have a steel, vital steel industry 
because it's part of your factors of production that we've learned in economics and again in, in international. Let me, I'm not uh, the, uh, the, this chapter here. This author didn't talk about sovereign wealth, but if you look at a lot of countries, <coughs> including United States company uh, country uh, companies and countries, uh, they're basically going to another country like Africa and say, hey, we'll uh, improve your infrastructure and all this, but you have to. Your money's not worth this. Uh, or it's not worth as much on the exchange rate, but we want your resources, and so for the next five years we get we pump so much oil or, or gold or, or diamonds or whatever, but we'll do all the infrastructure for you and we'll train your individuals in rationale. I'm not saying uh, it, it's the right way, and some are been taken advantage of, but in the overall that's what it means. Okay, are we good? So dumping is illegal, hard to prove. Uh, it, you know. I mean, that's, we, we discussed in the class when we talked about uh, 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 the, the different manufacturers. Okay? Now, small businesses. <coughs> According to a lot of research, counter to economics is, is maybe the key to global job growth. They only make up, they make up almost half of the private sector and only 30% of small businesses export. That's, it should be at least 50%. Half of it, export more than we do. Sell it overseas. There's so many people out there that want our product. You just gotta find that niche. By 2008, they expect that half a small business will export. They expect. But how you gonna start? Community college. We gotta get you to start thinking. Start thinking about that. Take some classes. Look me up and take some classes I'm teaching. <coughs> Getting help, export assistance. You know, provides on hand exporting to tie up with the Small Business Association, trade and finances. Let's see what I have in here. Wish to directly export goods and services uh, for small and medium sized business, uh, uh, trade centers, help companies engage in indirect exporting by matching buyers and sellers, dealing with foreign customer, uh, customs, office, documentation, and conversation. So let's see. So we have everything done here. So if I really look at everything else, we have covered everything I said I was going to cover. I'm just going to review real quickly. You, you, you just bring this up at 100. Okay, so you know a little about the uh, economy. Take some international business. Be aware of what's going on globally. It affects us indirectly. Uh, different workplaces, different agreements that's out there. Uh, why international trade is important. Understand the exchange rate, especially those that go overseas or Mexico or Canada. You're buying stuff or you buy something online. Uh, remember, the exchange rate is whatever the exchange rate is at the time when they ship the goods. <coughs> at least that's what you should be charged. Some companies wait till to get a better uh, 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 exchange rate for them. All right, but in theory, it's supposed to go to the minute as uh, send it out. Uh, uh, competitive advantages, remember, absolute and comparative. Uh, going international just makes sense. Levels of international involvement. I didn't have it in here, but uh, I talked about you start off with your agent, your licensing, you know, your manufacturing, your direct foreign investment, and they basically are multinational. You have uh, facilities and location by each geographic market. Uh, we talked about different organizational structures, barriers to internationals. You know, you have your culture, your political, your uh, uh, legal. You have uh, other barriers, your your your, your uh, quotas, your. Uh, uh, dumping your technology, remember, uh, uh, taxes, revenues, okay? And understanding different cultures, environment, every culture has different religions, uh, different rules, different laws, different customs. You're dealing with that culture and make sure your product is not offensive and uh, it works within their logistics and their uh, supply chain and how their culture will, will, will buy and purchase and uh, the use of their, your product in their, in their environment. Okay, the small businesses, remember, you're the ones that the government's looking at to basically uh, uh, help us go from a deficit or a negative uh, balance of uh, trade into a positive, more exporting. You're not importing. Sure, we get a lot of good stuff. We got to start selling our stuff overseas. And you should start off the minute you open up your new business, start thinking how can I think locally, but think globally always at the same time. Okay? And getting help with small business associations, always associated uh, with, with your community colleges. A lot of community colleges have specific courses, everything else that will help you uh, start this small business. Again, my name is Dr. George Pachaki, and this was Global Business, a general overview to what we've uh, read in the book. 
the homework assignments, our lectures, uh, integrated softwares, and everything else that's been provided to you. And I'll see you in the next section. Have a nice day. Bye.